So if you'd like to go ahead and give us an opening prayer. You're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I forget that once in a while. Sorry about that. All right, let's go ahead and pray then. Our God, Father, we just come before you. We thank you so much for your goodness, your provision, and um, all that is being worked on, Lord, to help sustain us through the food uh, program. I pray, Lord, for each one that is a part of it. Give us wisdom as we uh, strive to work together with what you've given us through creation to provide the needs of men, women, and children uh, in our communities. And I just pray, Lord, that it would bring glory to you as one that has uh, provided all of this. I thank you for those that have uh, are sacrificing, those that are working in this program. And we ask, Lord, your wisdom upon them and blessings upon their lives as they dedicate this service to you. Uh, bless this meeting as we come together to discuss and to learn about uh, seeds and the programs that are available and how that this is going to help us uh, accomplish our goals. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If I can. Ali Tiji Tukuriman, good afternoon to all. Mikara Siti Mimi Kicha Mikani. My name is Mimi. I am Kicha from the Antisuyu and Kuti Suyu Territories. And we are very excited about today's presentation and grateful for you sharing your time with us. We want to thank Pastor Ralph for his prayer and all the beautiful words that he's putting into the Garden of Eden. And we're just going to go over today's agenda briefly and then I will just um, headway to our amazing guest speaker for today. So today's agenda is going to include a seed saving workshop by Clayton Brasketer from the traditional Native American Farmers Association. We will introduce you to the seed house initiative we've been working on, and it will follow by a Q&A that will start with a traditional food account by Sunny Frank, a member of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And we will finally close with questions and hopefully spark a discussion. At this time, we want to welcome um, Clayton. We are truly grateful for today's guest speaker and his family's three decades of work with Indigenous Seed, which has helped shape the dream of agricultural restoration and has modeled what this work can be for youth across the world. Um, you know, so that we can dream of seed restoration in our communities as well. I'll stop my screen share and let Clayton introduce himself and his nation and more of the work of Tanafa. Thank you. Now, Posa Yemu King of Kawan, now Okwato Omu, Navite, Povi Ochute, Dimu, now Tetsuke, Winky, Owiri. Um, my name is uh, Clayton Brockope. I am presently living in the um, uh, uh, Tusuke Pueblo. Uh, it's just north of Santa Fe, New Mexico, but I'm uh, a, a Mohawk, a bear clan, and, but I've been living here in my wife's community since um, 1973. I'm the program director. Um, well, actually, yeah, I'll take that, I'll go back a little bit. I'm, uh, I do farm. I've uh, been active in uh, that since I was a kid, like many people. Um, I started um, working commercial farms at age 13. And um, some people, for some reason or other, don't enjoy farm work, but for some reason or other, it, I always, uh, um, I don't, I'm not sure if the word is enjoy, but uh, just uh, um, gravitated to it, right? It was um, something that um, I um, always wanted to do, I guess. Um, <clears throat> And like for now, like uh, here where, where I'm living now in uh, uh, Pueblo of Tezuki, um, we have a family farm. Um, it's, it depends on the, the season. 
Um, you know, we have uh, last couple of years we've been in drought. So um, sometimes we, 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 by necessity, we plant less and other years we can plant more. Last two years it's been, uh, we've been in drought. Previous to that, we had like four pretty decent years of rainfall. And then beyond that, uh, maybe 10 years of drought <laughs> previous before that. But uh, um, so that's kind of um, a little history of what I, what I do, what I've been doing. Um, back in 1992, um, there was a convening of an intertribal um, convening of um, uh, indigenous farmers from both New Mexico and Arizona. And I, if I remember correctly, there was about 70 people present from New Mexico and Arizona, from the different Pueblos, from the different tribes. Um, and out of that 70, there was only two younger families present. And uh, I and my wife and one of my daughters was there and another younger family um, from Arizona. And I don't, I don't remember exactly who they were. And um, one for, for basically two days um, at this meeting, all the other uh, farmers, uh, both uh, men and uh, women, uh, were probably, I would say, averaging from 55 years old all the way up to, I remember some of the uh, farmers that were still active farming were in their 80s. And um, they <clears throat> expressed concern over a lot of things, but one of the um, concerns they did bring up was that they had their perception or could see that um, young people uh, in their communities and their families um, weren't very interested in farming or ag or anything like that. Uh, that was one of the concerns. The other concern was um, the seeds that our ancestors always had in our communities, um, that they were um, um, diminishing, um, uh, losing them in some cases, uh, because young people were, weren't continuing to um, be farming, gardening, or anything like that. And um, so that, that was, there was a few other things um, that, was, that they were concerned about too, but um, that was, to me, the, um, uh, something that they they wanted to to be addressing, and but like I said, it was 1992, and uh, we had co several consecutive meetings after that, and informed uh, the traditional Native American Farmers Association, which I'm the um, program director of now. It's a nonprofit. We're um, an affiliate program of what um, is called the Seventh Generation Fund. They hold the uh, 501c3 um, uh, tax ID. Um, and basically what I do is I design educational programs for indigenous uh, communities. Um, and um, I write grants, I write the reports. I, I'm pretty much at this point uh, do most of it. Um, we do a number of programs. One is actually, uh, we, that was one of the things that we did start right away was um, seed, um, seed saving, seed growing workshops very early on um, because that was expressed by the elders that was like um, a priority or critical need that they, they wanted to um, have addressed. Uh, so we designed programs that would uh, do that, but also um, figured, tried our best to figure out how to um, um, get our young people uh, involved. And uh, at this point in time, we've been, I, I, in my estimation anyway, pretty successful at it. One of the other programs that we um, offer, um, have been offering since 
believe 1996 is it's called the Indigenous Sustainable Communities Design Course. And um, uh, Mimi actually took that, I don't know when exactly, a few years back, maybe four or five years ago. And um, it, it's always exciting to see young people um, attend, but also even more so that they um, continue that type of um, uh, um, activity. Um, <coughs> um, and part of that course is a 13 day course. We also cover just one day in seed saving, um, seed growing, seed conservation and seed protection. Uh, starting tomorrow, I'm doing a two day hands on uh, workshop in, in seed saving in, in a Pueblo just north of here. Um, what I'm going to do is um, kind of get into that part of it, but I want to ask a couple questions, even as I'm going through and um, um, uh, I, you know, I, I'm just looking at trying to get some feedback from um, from from people here. Um, the first question I have is, uh, you could do it raise of hand or by voice if you're if you're not muted. Um, who here um, has a garden or is farming currently? That's pretty much everybody that's on right now. That's great. Um, in, in some cases, um, I've, we've done these, I started this question and in many, many situations, you'll get maybe a fourth of the people uh, raise their hand. Um, I've done some in the Pueblos here with uh, uh, um, high school kids. And um, I don't know if, if, how, how many people are familiar with the Pueblo communities here in uh, New Mexico, um, I, I got probably like uh, nine tenths of the kids who were saying, yeah, I'm, you know, I garden, I farm, I help my family, I help my parents, I help my grandparents. And um, that may have not been the case um, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, and since we started our, um, this association, uh, those numbers of people involved in it have been growing in, in um, you know, uh, more and more people have gotten involved in it. Um, the other question I have is in your farm or your garden, um, are you using the traditional seeds or you're purchasing seeds from other sources? It's a yes or I guess. <laughs> it's a mix. It's a mixture of uh, purchasing from uh, a, an outside source. And then uh, I've also purchased, uh, uh, recently purchased seeds um, through indigenous, um, native indigenous seed search. Oh, okay. Good. Good. Um, uh, the seeds we do purchase, we always try to go for the non GMO, right. you know non Monsanto stuff. So that's good. But okay, great. Um, yeah, just to get, give me a little bit of, you know, I'm trying to get a little bit of background. Uh, what my plan is, um, is to cover a little, um, just a little bit about um, how uh, we um, when we do get seeds, when we have our seeds, um, how do we, I guess, um, keep them in, in good condition, uh, keep them from crossing? You know, like you were saying, maybe you're getting seeds from your own communities, but then you have something that's from somewhere else. Um, you know, corn can cross very, very easily, oh. yeah, it's cross wind pollinated. The things that are insect pollinated, you can do the same thing. You can cross, you know, if you got squashes from uh, your own communities and some that are from other uh, you know, source from somewhere else, you don't really want those to cross. And so that's kind of um, 
my what I was going to try to um, at least touch on uh, that seems to be um, uh, the information that um, uh, people are looking for at this point. Um, one, several, I did send some um, documents, I think, and I don't know if Mimi's forwarded them to you uh, um, uh, that we've come up with over the over a period of time. Um, one of the reasons that we, especially here in the Southwest and perhaps there in your area, because the climates are so different, um, that the seeds that we, our ancestors um, um, handed down for generations are um, uh, adapted to these climates. Um, and if you get seeds from another source, we don't, one, we don't know where they were growing. We don't know how they were grown, and then we don't know how well they'll do um, in your particular area. You know, you may, you, you know, you have a different length of uh, seasons. You have different um, uh, night, night and day, daylight that's affected by seeds, uh, how they grow, uh, moisture. Um, here we ha we don't have as much moisture as perhaps these guys have there in Florida. In a good year here, a good season, um, we may get 16 to 18 inches annually. These guys might get that in a week, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and we're we're up high. We're, where we farm is um, uh, about 7,000 feet. That's we're in the valley too. So, anyways, so those are some of the what reasons why you want to be growing and taking care of your own seeds. The other thing that we did, uh, we were finding out, and we knew, our ancestors knew that. When uh, I talked about that uh, uh, meeting with these elders back in 92, they were saying, you know, the foods that are, are the seeds and the foods that um, our ancestors passed on to us, it's a lot healthier for you. And some of the um, crops have been studied uh, for nutritional value. Uh, the traditional uh, crops, and it's been proven time and time again that um, these um, older varieties are uh, superior in nutrition, and I'll say even in flavor. So um, that's just a couple of reasons. There's others that I, I'll probably try to touch on. What I'm going to try to do is uh, go uh, do some high-tech stuff here and uh, uh, move to the screen share. This is one of the um, presentations that we use. Um, we've developed over a period of time. Like I said, I'll um, skip through some of the um, through some of these slides, and we'll get right into um, some of the nitty gritty about it. Um, <clears throat> why is seed keep keeping important? Uh, keeping the rare traditional indigenous seeds from season to season. Uh, again, um, you know, these are uh, uh, um, uh, climate and uh, geographically specific. That doesn't mean seeds can't move because they've always moved around with our people. Um, and, um, but it's good to have those things, um, you know, Especially now, we're you know people are talking about climate change, climate chaos, and um, you know I've mentioned the drought, and um, a lot of the seeds that we do have have that um, memory of already surviving droughts. Um, that may be the not so much maybe the case even in uh, your area where um, you have varieties that can withstand wetter periods for extended periods of time. Um, if you're getting seeds from other locations, they may not have that um, genetic information to uh, adjust to those um, um, wild or uh, varying climate swings. <clears throat> um, these are just a few um, uh, words that you'll hear um, when you're talking about seeds, uh, someone mentioned earlier about GMO seeds. 
Um, they're actually, uh, they're patented, they're, um, they're owned by a corporation. Uh, uh, GMO is uh, either GE or GMO, genetically modified organism or genetically engineered. Um, um, an open pollinated seed is just one that um, um, crosses with, uh, with itself. Um, they're pollinated either by wind or by insects. Um, heirloom seeds is another term you might hear. And basically that's, um, it could be identified. It, can, it will be an open pollinated, but it'll be something that maybe your family has um, um, continued to grow um, through generations. Um, maybe your community has um, um, grown it through generations. It's just a terminology. Uh, same thing with land race. It's the same, um, basically, uh, that terminology, you'll hear that. And um, you're just trying to um, clarify that um, these, a lot of these um, terminologies sort of overlap. Um, organic seeds is basic. It, um, it could be the stuff that you're growing, but it may not be certified organic, right? Uh, but it... it it's basically just um, a classification of that um, they, how, however you grew them, it, it um, uh, fit, uh, fit a, um, an organic standard and guidelines. Uh, if there's questions, um, uh, maybe you could raise your hand and uh, I'll try to answer them also as I'm going through these. Um, if I don't see it, um, uh, one of the other hosts could let me know, or even uh, if you put it in the chat. Yeah, I'll monitor the chat for you. And if anything comes up, I'll make sure to kind of tap you on the shoulder. Okay, because I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to read it at this point. Um, no problem. I got, I got it. I got it. Okay, you. thank you. Um, so just going through um, some more terminology, um, a hybrid seed. Um, and there's a uh, illustration there in the in and the slide. Um, basically, there's other crops uh, besides corn that are hybridized. Um, if you're purchasing um, seeds from a store or from a catalog, they will tell you if it's a hybrid or not. Basically, um, like corns, they'll take two uh, parent lines. Um, and they'll they'll cross they'll interbreed them. What they'll do is they'll take um, um, because in in a corn there's um, uh, the reproductive organs, both male and female. The uh, top is uh, the I don't know what, what do they call it. The tasseling is the flower. The male pollen uh, is produced there, and it lands on the silks. Um, and when they hybridize corn, what they'll do is they'll, they'll take one of those uh, lines and either they'll, they'll, they'll take the tassels off and so that they're um, um, making sure that um, just the pollens that they want to cross with the females, that's going to happen. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons, several of the reasons why um, um, there is a high, what they call a hybrid uh, varieties is basically for to uh, standardize its um, its physical appearance. Um, they go to extremes, um, especially if, if anybody's bought canned corn, sweet corn. Um, it's a hybrid corn, and um, the they've got it narrowed down uh, genetically that um, they once they're planted in the ground mechanically, that um, it'll grow um, so evenly and they'll all mature within a twenty-four hour period at the same the same time maturity. Um, on the other hand, our land race corns, our traditional corns, um, will um, usually 
the stuff we that we grow here will mature over a different period of time. Sometimes it'll be a week, sometimes uh, 10 to 14 days. So you'll have some uh, cobs that will mature at earlier and some within uh, within the next week or so. Um, so that's um, one of the reasons why um, um, you'll see hybrids. The, the other reason behind hybrids is also um, standardization. Um, and I'll go. I'll talk about corn a little bit more on that. Is because um, if you look at a commercial corn field, uh, you'll always see two cobs on there. Let me see, uh, two corn cobs on each one, and they're all one. The bottom one's at a certain height, and the top one's at a certain height. That's a um, uh, a, a trait that they've bred into um that hybrid it either be a hybrid or a gmo corn um it's uh uniformity that they're they're looking for um so they may have bred out other things like our traditional corns have uh like flavor uh disease resistance um pest resistance and nutrition um, you know, what, once they narrow that uh, genetics down, um, you know, they're losing some stuff, but gaining that uniformity because it's going to be um, uh, harvested with a machine mechanically. So uh, the most machines aren't geared for um, harvesting our traditional crops. Um, hybrid squashes. Um, Again, they'll cross um, um, several different varieties to produce uh, the, the hybrid seed. Um, and they're looking at uniformity also. Um, the shape, the color, uh, the texture, and so forth. Uh, tomatoes also, you know, uh, they're, they're looking at uniformity and sometimes breeding out other traits. Um, this um, presentation, I believe, I, I know I had um, emailed it to Mimi, and um, I'm hoping that she forwarded it to everybody else. You can, uh, there's a lot of good information in there. You can be reading at, um, at you know, whenever you have time. And if you have question, more questions, um, uh, you know, on there, um, you can uh, maybe reach me at you know by email or some some forth uh, in or some other way. Um, what we call the three sisters: corn, beans, and squash. Um, I'll let to cover that because um, it talks about the three different ways of how plants um, pollinate each other. Corn is by wind. Uh, squash is insect pollination and beans. Uh, most common beans are self pollinating, not all. Um, so, what that means, like a bean, um, the way their their makeup of their uh, blossom is, they have both. Uh, uh, they call it a perfect flower. Um, it has both um, male and female reproductive um, um, organs within, its, within itself and it self pollinates. Um, so if you have different common beans that you're growing, especially um, um, the older varieties, um, those can be planted relatively close to each other, um, even side by side. Uh, we've tried different beans over the years. Um, each season, we try we plant at least four different varieties, and you can basically plant them uh, side by side. That's not the case with squash or corn, uh, because uh, if you know if you got a couple of different varieties of squashes that you want to grow, um, and you want to keep the seeds from them, 
you're going to have to isolate them. Same thing with corn. You're going to have to isolate them, keep them further and further apart. But beans, with beans, um, that's so much not the case. Um, there are other varieties of beans, and they're usually um, labeled a runner bean. There's um, scientific names, botanical names uh, for them also. And it's good to um, kind of keep track of those botanical names. Um, so you know if you are, if you are wanting to save um, and produce really good seed, you'll have to know those things and uh, depends on where you're sourcing your seeds. Um, you know look for those botanical names, especially. Um, the runner beans will cross with your other beans. And I found that out because I thought um, at one point in time, I had assumed that um, uh, beans do not cross with each other, but some of them will. If you have any questions on beans, let me know. Squash, um, there are, I don't know if there's another slide um, that breaks down the, um, let me see if I can find it. There's five different families, I guess, of squashes. Um, and they have the, like I said, they have the, the botanical name. I'm looking for it right now. Um, and in those families, um, this is one, um, uh, Kribita maxima, that's one of the families. There's Pepo, I don't know if this shows, Pepo and Mushada. So if you're looking at, um, if you got squashes, um, and if you're purchase, uh, sourcing them like from uh, a store or somewhere, check, they usually have the botanical name. If you're not um, getting them like that, and maybe you're getting them from your neighbor or um, old varieties that you already have, in your communities, one way to sort of figure that out is what grouping, which family they, they're, they're in is by identifying them by the, the, um, um, the appearance of the seed itself. Um, I don't think we have a slide that uh, differentiates um, those, the squash seeds, but there are, um, publications out there that do that. What I would do, what I usually do, because we like to grow a lot of squashes in our garden and in our fields, is one is we can, um, you, well, I, well, like I said, use isolation, meaning that um, some years we have three different fields that we can plant in. Um, and so we'll, you know, we'll plant them um, in one garden or one field one variety, the other variety in another field, and they're they're separated either by, you know, not by a mile, but by probably by um, uh, several hundred yards, if not if not further, um, because they are insect poll pollinated. Um, it's rare that you'll see. Um, uh, cross pollination happening. It's possible, but it's rare uh, when you do it that way. Um, are you just growing old varieties of squashes from your territories right now? Okay. Um, are there several different varieties or just one? Just, I, I you're, you're speaking, but I can't hear. Sunny. Take yourself off mute. I think there are a couple muted people. He's still muted. <laughs> Sonny, you're muted. Yeah, because the host muted me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, you know, uh, here in Florida, we have the Seminole pumpkins. And uh, we, we still have folks that, you know, uh, hold those seeds. And, and that's one of the few seeds that I think that are collected. Okay. And there are some corns, but, you know, um, 
folks here in, in, in uh, I, I live on the Hollywood reservation and that's okay. just one reservation of seven that the Seminole tribe have scattered throughout the state of Florida. But my setting is an urban setting. Okay. So there's not a lot of folks that uh, actually uh, grow, but we would like to change them. But there is the pumpkin. The Seminole pumpkin is one of the main ones that uh, is the main staple that they do collect that seed and it's still within our, our tribe that they use. So that was just to answer your question. Okay. Um, so one way to, you know, like you said, you, you're, you're more of a, maybe in um, an urban um, uh, area, there may be other people growing other squashes that are from you know, they purchase at the store or whatever, pumpkins. Or yeah. Whatever. So if you if you have that um, um, that Seminole pumpkin and you don't want it to cross, one of the ways you can minimize that, like again, like I said, isolation. But uh, bees don't know; they only know blossoms, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, what you what you can do is um, hand pollinate. And again, I don't believe there's a slide in here that um, will uh, show you, but you can, it's easy to find out. Um, there's two different blossoms on your, uh, on your squash plants. And one is a male and one's a female. And what you're gonna do is if you're gonna hand pollinate those, is you're gonna get up um, relatively early in the morning, you're gonna see that those blossoms growing, they're gonna be, fairly closed up pretty tight and you're going to watch them every morning it looks like they're going to open up a little bit that morning when it looks like they're going to open up you're going to you're going to try to get there before they actually open up and you're going to look peek inside and you're going to see the male blossom and it basically kind of looks like this on the inside right i'm trying to get it if these guys can see it the female blossom um I don't know if it's in any of these pictures or not. No. Um, you can see the zucchini, right? Yes. Yeah, there's a blossom on the end of that. And the little, um, uh, looks like a baby zucchini, it'll have, it'll have that. Um, it, if it's a zucchini, it'll be cylindrical like that. If it's a round one, it'll be round. And that's actually the ovaries. And inside the blossom, it kind of looks like this. Um, and that's the female. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the, many of the male blossoms and insert them into, you can use the blossom itself and insert it right into the, the female blossom. And what I'll do is I'll mark it with what they call painter's tape, that blue tape. I have some here somewhere. And uh, and label it, and so it's been it's been hand pollinated, and uh, you'll keep track of that those fruits that you hand pollinate just specifically for for seed, right? So uh, that's that's um, a practice that we've done. Um, corn, on the other hand, it's wind pollinated. And so isolation is the best policy for that. In different areas, depending where you are, they say uh, at least a mile apart. If you don't have that luxury, what we've been doing is um, planting barrier plants in between, um, meaning um, say we got a stand of corn and um, in between, there'll still be a distance between the two fields, uh, not a mile, but um, in, in some cases we've only done like, um, oh, I would say 25, 30 yards apart. But in between those corns, we'll plant um, either sunflowers because they're gonna be tall and sticky. We planted sorghum and sometimes tobacco, a wild tobacco, or not a wild tobacco, but a native tobacco. Um, they're gonna try to grow nearly as tall as your corn. They're gonna be sticky. And um, what we'll also do is orient them 
so that because they are wind pollinated, that the prevailing winds when they're um, tasseling, the, they won't they won't blow into each other. So that's a, um, a practice we've been doing. Um, the other thing we'll do when with all of that, what, what we'll also do is um, um, only take the seed from the centers of those fields. Um, and the rest of it can be, you know, consumed. And, and so we, you'll have fairly good um, um, uh, production of uh, cross seeds that haven't crossed from one grouping to another. Uh, so it sounds like you're using the, um, like you actually like sacrifice some of the, the corn on the edges, knowing that they could have potentially been contaminated. Right. Plus you're using the tobacco and the sorghum and the other, you know, the sunflowers as the barriers, additional barriers. Exactly. And they're okay. all, they're all tall and they're all sticky. Okay. And you say you, you put them on the border, but, and what do you use? You said to, um, you to kind of block between. them from, oh, in between. So they don't even go on each other. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And it, it's been a practice we've been doing for quite a few years and we as of yet, um, we haven't had any crossings that we noticed, but usually what we'll do is we'll, we'll if we're going to plant two different corns in a given year, one, one corn will be our larger field and another, the other field specifically for seed would be a smaller field and they're like, they're not going to be, um, um, they have a, a, a uh, physically they have a um, um, you know they don't look similar to one another. Um, this year we planted a uh, a blue corn, and the other field it was a speckled corn. I'm trying to find a I have it here somewhere. Anyway, so it, the other years we planted. Um, um, like a pink corn and a um, and a blue corn, uh, so that they're physically, if there was any crossing, um, it would be fairly evident just in their appearance. Um, I don't know how much more time I got, um, but once you do have, I'll get a little bit into um, seed saving. Um, what you want to do is if when you are producing specifically for seed. Um, and this goes for everything uh, in seed. You want it to grow to full maturity. As you know, um, in our fields, our um, like for corn, um, I, I've got this picture behind me in my background. Um, that's a fully mature cornfield. It's dried, right? And it's been in um, completely. Um, as long as possible. And what we'll, what we will do is um, we'll, we're harvesting it for food and some of it's for seed and we'll, uh, we'll just put everything all together. Um, and then um, as we're husking, it's all of our work is done by hand. And um, uh, we'll start selecting for seed, um, and what we when we're looking for seed from from these uh, from a, a given field, a given crop is um, we I don't look for uniformity like for a certain size cob. Um, what I'm looking for is if it's healthy, um, if it doesn't have any disease plant disease present or um, um, in um, minimal, if any, uh, insect uh, damage to it. That's all I'm, I'm looking for. Um, and then we'll, we'll shell it and it's gotta be dry. And then this slide uh, for storage, you want it to be in a cool place, somewhere it's dark and somewhere it's dry. Cause you think about seeds, what they need to germinate is it needs to be warm 
You need sunlight. They love, they love sunlight and it needs to be wet and moist. So you just deny them of those things um, in order to store them. Um, there's a, the chart or the, the word um, temperature in Fahrenheit should be equal or less than one uh, relative humidity temperature in Fahrenheit should be equal or less than 100. Basically, that means if you're if you got a place to store them, um, say the room is got fifty percent humidity, and uh, the temperature is at fifty degrees. That that number equals a hundred. You want it to be below that for optimal storage. You know, uh, here we're very dry. We can get um, uh, our some of the rooms. Um, down to 5% humidity. And, um, you know, and if it's cooler, say 40 degrees, um, you add those two numbers together, is that 45? You could even drop it even more, you know, it, um, that's what you want. The, the biggest mistake, the biggest fear I have is um, thinking the seeds are, are pretty dry and putting them away and they have um, a little bit of moisture in them, um, they will uh, mold and they will spoil. I know that firsthand. So if you think it's dry enough, dry it a little bit more. We don't dry seeds in direct sunlight. You want to dry seeds um, in a shade, but somewhere where there's um, uh, wind to uh, remove the moisture from. Um, I think I'm running out of time. Um, we are um, encouraging everyone to, um, let's see if I can pull, get out of this somehow. Um, I don't know exactly, I may lose everything. <laughs> oh, I see it, okay. Hold on a second. Stop. Okay. All right. Um, we're encouraging each individual farmer to um, be aware of um, growing seeds, saving seeds. We're in our community. We have more farmers than previous uh, than previously used to be. Um, we're encouraging each one to do that. Uh, the community has a seed bank. And at this point in time, um, it, I believe it has well over a thousand accessions. That doesn't mean a thousand different varieties, but it may mean like um, uh, there may be four or five or 10 different types of blue corn in there, white corns, pink corns, purple corns, same thing with squashes, you know, many different varieties of squashes, you name it, it we have it in there. And um, again, that's addressing uh, uh, our own uh, dietary needs or nutritional needs, um, um, dealing with climate chaos, but also, um, you know, this in the beginning of the pandemic, um, if you tried to find seed, it was nearly impossible to find seeds. The seed, conventional seed companies crashed during the pandemic. They had so many people looking for seeds, people looking, they wanted, they were uh, wanting some sort, some form of food security. And those seed companies just really had a very, very difficult time. And um, we felt a little bit better here in our community or in our family because we already had those seeds. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. I know there's questions and there's um, other people that uh, we, we have a lot of time to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a question by Pastor Ralph. He asked, we are in a high humidity area. Putting the seeds in a steel jar would help. Say it again, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's asking because uh, they're in a very humid area. He's asking right. if storing the seeds in a sealed jar 
could help or serve them or if there's any other method um, I imagine uh, again it has to be really really dry before you uh, do put it into jars and we we have a lot of our seeds in jars um, here's just a little example uh, glass works better than plastic because even plastic permeates a little bit meaning moisture can get in there um i have larger jars smaller jars um if we have a lot of seeds um we i i try to put stuff in cotton bags and hang them so they're not touching anything but yeah glass jars but making sure that before you're putting them into any container um that they are very dry metal jars are probably the worst because they condense moisture on them. We can, I also have a question. I met a seed keeper from Goshen, Indiana, and he has a lot of different varieties of corn. And once he has them dried and that's pretty, um, I think he uses a dehumidifier in his seed storage room. But once it's dry, he will um, froze them. He'll froze them for like four or five days to prevent any kind of um, larvae or eggs right. that might be on the seat and then stores them um, on the basement in a pretty dark and low humidity place. Right. What she's saying is, um, say I have this jar of seed and I wasn't sure um, if there's uh, larva or um, insect eggs in there, you can freeze them, put them in a freezer some recommend uh, 24 hours, some recommend 48 hours, and you can take them back out and anything that was in there that may have been alive will, will be dead. Again, um, you'll, you'll have to check the moisture content uh, of that. The other thing I started to do with, with these um, um, is I've got actually bigger jars. I don't have them here because I started moving stuff for this other presentation tomorrow is I'll put those silica packets inside them. You can, uh, you're probably familiar with those. Sometimes you, you buy stuff and they have those silica packets in there to wick moisture away from things. <clears throat> you can save, I'm saving all of those, but you can also buy them from different sources. So those, that's another um, practice we started. Um, the best way, <clears throat> and uh, I didn't even talk a little bit about longevity. Um, um, if everything is done right, and if you got it in, in a really dry and a really cool place, um, some of these seeds can keep for um, at least decades, if not longer. But in your situation here in Florida, it, that lifespan may be shorter. Um, I do a lot of work in um, uh, Central America that's similar uh, climate to where you guys are and um, they recommend um, planting um, whatever they saved the following year right it doesn't have as long you know corns and whatever beans it doesn't have that shelf life as as we as we do here but um, if you have a build a facility like we have here in the village you may have a longer shelf life Absolutely. Thank you so much. And for the sake of time, we're going to advance to our next speaker. And in the process of putting together the seed initiative, you know, um, we had a lot to look forward to and believe. And it's mainly the reason in the future where we can plant our ancestors' seeds and our children know where they come from. You know, these include the future of clean water, thriving soil, healthy air, and flourishing communities. And Stephanie has a little reflection for us along those lines. And we'll do that reflection and we're gonna skip a little bit of the seed introduction. We will have a later event for that on February. And I will allow, um, after Stephanie, Sunny will share with us a narrative of traditional food that he has been so kind to um, share with us. So Stephanie, did you see here? Take it away. 
Okay, so um, I'm just going to say a prayer and I'll include the reflection in the prayer. It'll be like a reflective prayer, okay? All right. Dear Lord, thank you for this presenter, Clayton, and the information that he brought before us today. And just thank you for giving us this information and helping us to realize the importance of saving our seeds and, uh, you know, just uh, in ensuring that we have a future and sustainability for our garden and for the people that we're hoping to bless with the things that we grow in our garden. And uh, we just, we also come to you before you for, um, just a burden on our heart for not only our youth, but all of the people around us to open their eyes and realize the importance of learning how to grow their own food and learning how to sustain their own lives and uh, how important that is in, in life in general, but in the world today. And we just don't know the direction in which things are gonna go. And, you know, um, foods is here today, but it, it might not be tomorrow. And just like he was saying about the seeds and the shortage that uh, we went through during the pandemic, uh, we went through a shortage of food and we just understand now more than ever that it's important that we can sustain our lives and uh, we're not completely and totally dependent on an outside source for our food. And we thank you so much for creating us and creating gardens and creating this way of life for us and just putting yourself into everything that we know and that we love. And we just thank you so much for all that you do and uh, watch over us and encourage the people around us to get more involved and just help our garden to grow and flourish uh, and help others to just want to be a part of it. And we love you and thank you for everything in your name, amen. Amen. I am gonna start the screen of you briefly. There should be a couple of seconds. <coughs> Alrighty, so I'd like to introduce you to some of the families who have been part of the Seed House. As you've learned through creation, these are often family efforts. First, we have the um, our partners at the Garden of Eastern who offer ministry to an intergenerational community. They are very good hearted people and can always use a hand in case anybody here would like to volunteer. They started their permaculture initiative to provide nourishing foods and an educational home for those wishing to learn to be full and healthy life. And as you can see here, we have uh, Jenny Frank, who is a member of the Seminole Tribe of Florida in the far upper left. His wife, Stephanie, Pastor Rob, and his wife, Kathy. And I really look forward to working more with them and getting to know them for there. It's been a joy to work um, alongside. We also have Samuel Tommy, who is also a member of the Seminole Tribe of Florida and has been a collaborator of the Seed House Restoration Initiative uh, since the beginning in 2021. He's a grandfather, he's an activist, and he's a, pub a published artist. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here today due to personal matters, but you know, passing along that gratitude for the words that he's um, shared with us. And the Seat House for South Florida is started by identifying people who hold these varieties for 20 years or longer. So we were trying to assure a strong genetic true to the variety, and these are some of the relatives, and we planted them according to our traditional calendar, which is the moon calendar. And we start with this uh, heirloom dense cord, which is originally from uh, the migration history between Florida and Georgia. It's a delicious variety that produces hefty ears, is resistant to humidity conditions, and it's a variety that I look forward to going more. We have a lima bean, these are called marina, which are adopted from a neighbor Montubio community in our territory. And we also have seminal pumpkins, whose seeds are alive, really thanks to the brilliancy and resilience of seminal people in the context of war and colonialism. This is a picture of our first planting. You can see here Samuel Tommy fixing the rose. We also 
Um, here's a miniature seminal pumpkin that was harvested at the peak of the season. Um, in the far right, you can see Cherokee Trail of Tear Beans, which was donated by the Sosos family. They had been planting that variety for 35 years, and it's a variety that's very abundant, very delicious, and hearty in soups and stews. And from that variety, we got um, a white painted one. We didn't got a lot of them, but I've been saving them to see if um, that's a variety that will go true in those colors or it will continue to produce that black um, color as a main gene. We also, there's also the, the Cherokee Trail of Tear Beans and a second generation of the Seminole Pumpkin. Ending with the Yellow Monte Bean, which is, um, which is a variety that comes from a semi-tropical coastal community that has a trade relation with my own community in Zala. And these uh, are climbing beans and great for companion planting, also very delicious in stews and soups. And I hope that you can see here that there is a common theme, which is territorial adaptation. And we hope the seed house can become a hub for community seed needs, that they're all not only nutritious, as Clayton mentioned, in composition, but they're part of the history of Florida and the ever expanding narrative of traveling seed. You will get to know more about them and the stories and the lineages that they carry um, later on in the Gregorian year of 2023. But I wanted to leave room for, for Sunny's talk. So send me whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, want to start off by saying Chihin Tamo, uh, rough translation, that's a good day to you. Um, I first uh, want to say and give thanks to our creator and everyone here for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I also want to give thanks to our sponsors um, and, and partners, UHP, um, also Community Foundation of Broward, and also South Broward Community Health Hub. I want to say thank you to you guys for uh, giving us the opportunity to be a part of this and to help um, our community grow. Um, my name is Sonny Frank, and I am from the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Uh, I live on the Hollywood Reservation. Um, we have seven reservations scattered throughout the state of Florida, um, but my reservation is in the urban setting here in between Fort Lauderdale and Miami. And uh, I am just one of the four individuals uh, that represent Parkway Garden, and it's also known as the Garden of Eaton. Um, I think as Mimi has mentioned before, um, myself, uh, my father-in-law, and Pastor Ralph, um, my wife, Stephanie, and um, also Kathy, which is Ralph's wife, my mother-in-law. And uh, we make up, you know, the managing group of Parkway uh, Garden, also Eaton Garden. But uh, to get back, you know, uh, on what I'm speaking about, you know, originally how I got into this uh, was um, uh, on our reservation, uh, I, I used to volunteer, let me go a little bit further back, you know, before the pandemic in 2020, uh, I was volunteering at um, the Fruitful Fields. It's a garden, a 10 acre garden uh, up in Pompano, which is roughly about 20 minutes, you know, from, from Hollywood. Um, and I started volunteering up there. And uh, one of the reasons uh, we wanted to bring it to the reservation uh, because like I said, we live in an urban setting and not too many people or, or tribal members are gardening or we don't even have a community garden on the reservation here. And so that was one of the hopes of, you know, uh, gardening and, and learning is bringing that back to our people because, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, living here in the, in, in the city, everybody, you know, this day and age pretty much goes to the grocery store or goes to the restaurant. And um, so uh, there was 
one day, I think just before 2020 or during the pandemic, uh, I think it was just before the pandemic because the reservation shut down for the last two years. But before that, they were doing, uh, uh, oh my gosh, it was a, <clears throat> Uh, they were doing like a, a farm uh, setting on the reservation. I say that, excuse me? Farmer's market? Yes, I'm sorry. They were doing a farmer's market on the reservation. And um, my wife and I went up to the farmer's market and, you know, before they were setting up and they were pulling out corn and vegetables out of packages <laughs> that they had purchased. And it was our health department that was doing this on our reservation. So, uh, and they were putting on this farmer's market, but they were pulling it out of packages and stuff. So that really, you know, um, struck a, a chord with me. And so that's what got myself involved and in wanting to start, you know, a community garden. And um, uh, then the reservation shut down. So there was no support in the community. So, um, so uh, my wife uh, had a vision that we were able to do this at our, our garden at the church and Pastor Ralph thought it was a good idea. And, you know, we, we uh, started putting our feet to the ground and we created our own little garden there. And so that's how we got started. Um, but, you know, in, in the process, you know, we have the Seminoles uh, have gotten out of touch with the foods that they eat and um and the traditional foods and that was another topic you know i've gone round and round um with my community when people talk about traditional foods they you know at our community events they're having spam rice and tomatoes and fry bread and i argued with you know a few folks and uh didn't want it to go too far so i just let it go but you know a lot of our folks here on the hollywood reservation used to they think that spam rice and tomatoes is traditional food and fried bread was traditional food. And that wasn't necessarily the, the case, you know, uh, as I spoke with them, you know, um, uh, uh, Safki was a traditional drink and on all the villages, there would always be a fire and you would always have Safki and Safki is made up of grits and corn that's, you know, crushed up and ground up. And, you know, it's it's really good and it will keep you full all day long. Um, and it depends on which village or which, you know, village you go to, you know, depending on the flavor. Some would do, you know, uh, dry cracked corn or some would just make cornmeal. And uh, so and that was something that, you know, was always on the fire. So for every camp that, that you would walk into and Seminoles weren't traditionally three meal we eat three meals a day it was primarily you eat when you're hungry so the ladies would always have you know something going on the on the uh fire all the time so when somebody got hungry it would, they would just go up and eat um so and so also speaking of fry bread um you you hear fry you know so Seminoles didn't have fry bread. They didn't use grease and stuff like that. So that was also another uh, topic. You know, I talked with folks because, you know, during our festivals and um, the tribal fairs uh, and even now at, at some of our ceremonies, the green corn dance, they're cooking fry bread. But that's not fry bread was not the traditional food. It was lapali and uh, lapali was uh, was flour that was made up. Um, of the kunti uh, plants, we call it wild kunti, but that was the roots. So it was grinded up and strained at least three to four times. It was a process. And then, you know, when it became powder form, then you would, you know, add your water and, and turn it into um, a bread, a dough, and then you would, you would make your bread out of that. Um, and it was a, a plant that had to be, like I said, um, processed at least three to four times because you know it's a poisonous plant if you didn't you could uh if you didn't process it three to four times you could uh, make yourself very very sick or perhaps kill yourself so you know um and that took a long time to create the flour and to create the bread so nowadays it's just easier for folks to go to the store and buy flour and then make the fry bread and, and a bunch of grease and <laughs> So, you know, uh, with those experiences, you know, uh, we wanted to bring back, you know, uh, getting involved spiritually uh, with your food and being sustainable um, on the reservation 
and getting folks, you know, in touch with the foods that you're growing, spending the time uh, and caring for the food and the seeds um, that you you plant and grow to get everybody back in touch and in tune with um, eating and, and creating healthy foods rather than, you know, eating processed foods and going to the, you know, restaurants like they do now. Uh, and that is a feat in itself. So uh, again, it was, it was hard to get, you know, um, some of these things going on the reservation, but uh, uh, Pastor Ralph and the congregation at Parkway Baptist gave us that opportunity. And now we're in our second year, you know, our second season of doing that. Um, so here we are. And I just wanted to give thanks to everybody. And um, um, thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Sunny. And finally, yeah, we want to close it uh, with a Q&A because of time around the sun, we have to close it a little earlier, but I hope that this event has shown, you know, the foods that we carried in our communities have history and they have provided us with health. And they also have forced us to pay attention to the health of our territories as a home, you know, water, our air, the quality and the kind of chemicals that come into our territories um, by different industries. And these foods not only allow us to maintain our, our agricultural traditions, but they allow us to hold our language. They allow us to continue our ceremonies and what makes us strong. So yeah, well, and with that, um, if there's any question that wasn't answered during this time, please email us. I put my personal email there. Sunny also agreed to have his email shared. And as Clayton said, that there can be questions forwarded his way. But we want to thank you for your time today and for attending this event. We really encourage you to continue to keep planting and nurturing your community that way. And we can wait for all the seeds that are coming home and that will be learning to care for together. Yes, this is a start, definitely. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Clayton, for sharing your information and your knowledge with us. And I hope to collaborate with you more in the future and uh, we work together. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, on that note, I was gonna say if I, I hope that we can continue to continue to I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can. Yep. Oh, okay, good. Um that you can continue that we can continue mm -hmm. to stay connected. Perfect. That we can continue to stay connected because there's um a lot of people that couldn't make it today, but um we're gonna share the recording with some of them. And I do think that we have um some work to do right now with our season, and then maybe after we started uh see uh, after into into the next season um maybe we can kind of re revisit debrief share learnings and so so let's keep thinking about that team i'm so excited that we got this and i can't wait to catch up like i said i feel like i lost a piece and i'm like ah so thank you all <laughs> yes i think i might have forgot to mention that you know uh we'll be hosting you know uh some some classes you know at the garden so um and once once we uh, get those dates that we'll put them out there and, and hopefully we can have a zoom meeting and have those classes during those times. Great. Well, I put in the chat earlier, um, I had traveled through some of the Seminole communities, but it was late 60s. Um, and I haven't been in that neck of the woods that recent, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and I don't know. We were. We may have been there in Hollywood, but it seems familiar. But um, is it Big Cypress? Oh yes, we have and, uh, the main. The three main reservations was Hollywood, Big Cypress, and Brighton. So, but Big yeah. Cypress was one probably that you definitely probably went through in the Everglades. Uh, right. The, yeah. Yep. Down Alligator Alley. Yep. Right. That was in the late 60s, so. Wow. It's anyway. been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my stepmother, she's a Sleta Pueblo, so I, we we go out to New Mexico. I've been going out to New Mexico since I was a child, so I'm familiar with the territory out there. Nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. 
Well, maybe we can um, um, try to figure some other things out. Um, you know, I see the interest and I see the need and uh, our association is, um, um, that's our mission, right? To, um, to put forth uh, educational programs and uh, reach out to uh, other uh, communities. Excellent. We'll be happy to have you. Alrighty, everybody. I think that concludes our event for tonight. I want to thank everybody from the bottom of my heart for all the work that you continue to do. And I hope everybody has a safe afternoon and good dreams tonight. <laughs> thank you very Thanks much. Tony. Thank Same you so much. You and to all of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, presenters, Clayton, Sonny. Thank appreciate you. it so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Beautifully done, everybody. Yes, take care, and we'll catch up later on, and uh, we'll be in touch, everybody. Thank you so much, Clayton, again, and thank you all. Have a good night. Okay. Enjoy good night. the evening and the weekend. You as well. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>